We've engaged in our worship thus far. We've had some men filling in at short notice because of the widespread sickness here. I appreciate, Howard, the manner in which you've led us in our singing and, Brian, the good comments that we've had at the table. And now we have an opportunity to open God's Word and to study from it. Open to Matthew chapter 20, if you would. Matthew chapter 20. We're going to use this passage uh, as we start our study together. Matthew chapter 20. I want to read verses 20 through 28 as we talk about greatness in the kingdom. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may set, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, "What You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to set on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. What do you want to be when you grow up? I remember being asked that when I was a little child, and we've all asked that of little children. We ask out of interest for our children's welfare because we know that they are going to grow up one day, and we know that they need to be doing something. We we want our Christians to be, be, uh, we want our children to be Christians. We want them to be faithful to the Lord. We want them to get the best education or training that they can, and to to make the best of their lives. I remember as far back when when I was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I thought, I want to be a fireman. As far back as I can remember, driving around in a big shiny red truck, putting out fires, rescuing people, I thought, "That's, that's the thing for me. That's what I want to be. I'm about as far from a fireman as you can get. Now, I resemble a fire hydrant but uh, I am not a fireman. What if the Lord were to ask you as his child, what do you want to be when you grow up spiritually? What do you want to be when you grow up spiritually? What would the Lord want of us? I believe our text answers that question. What the Lord wants of each and every one of us, the greatest thing that we could aspire to be in His kingdom is a servant. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about being a servant in the Lord's kingdom. That is the position to which our Lord ascribes greatness. A servant's primary obligation is to his master. A good servant will respect the authority of his master, will seek to be faithful, obedient, and useful to his master. Disciples of Christ are servants of Christ. And the great challenge that we have, the question that is asked of our Lord some 2,000 years ago that continues to echo in our hearts and minds today, Luke 6 verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? If we are Christians, we have made ourselves servants of Christ and we ought to be doing His will. But what we learn here in Matthew chapter 20 is that our role as a servant is much more inclusive than that of any other kind of servant. Not only are we to serve our master, but we must also be of a mind to serve one another. 
we must serve our fellow servants. James and John were seeking places of prominence in the kingdom. They went so far as to recruit their mother to come and to ask the Lord this favor for them. After telling them that it was not His to give, the Lord had to deal with the rest of the disciples and the negative impact that this request had upon them because they were always vying for this position of greatest in the kingdom. As a matter of fact, the, the ten, it says in verse 24 that they were greatly displeased with the two. They'd gotten their mother to ask him for this position. They were probably most upset that they hadn't thought to do that themselves. But here was the threat of the twelve using, losing their unity. And the Lord stepped in very quickly. Verse 25, He called them to Himself and He addressed the matter very quickly. He said, in the kingdoms of men, greatness is shown by the ability to exercise authority over other people. But Jesus says, that's not the way it is in my kingdom. And that's not how you're going to act in my kingdom. He says, in my kingdom, greatness is going to be demonstrated by a willingness to yield and to serve others. And we can talk about motivation for being a servant. And that would be a great study. It's, it's what Jesus says is greatest in the kingdom. It's following after His example, just as the Son of Man, verse 28, did not come to be served but to serve. But what I want to talk about this morning is how you and I can be servants of one another. I want to talk about four different things that a servant needs in order to be effective, in order to serve the way that God would have us to serve one another. So let's take a look at these four things. First, we have to have the right attitude. I must, if I'm going to be a servant, I must develop a servant's heart. Unlike anything that I would do in a worldly endeavor, the Bible tells me that attitude is very important in my service that I render unto God. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. If I'm going to be a good servant, I can't just go through the motions. If I'm truly going to be a servant, I have to work on my heart, and I have to develop a servant's heart. I have to have that right attitude. And that right attitude could be summed up in the word love, can't it? Jesus was asked the question in Matthew 22, What is the greatest commandment? And thinking that He would go to the Ten Commandments and pick one of those and elevate it above the others, they were laying a trap for Him. But Jesus didn't do that. Instead, He says in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the greatest attitude that we can have. If I'm going to be a servant, I have to develop a love for my fellow servants. This love, we know from passages like 1 Corinthians 13, this love is shown with an attitude of meekness, showing kindness and gentleness towards others, not, not harshness towards others. I have to serve with humility. Jesus said the Gentiles lord it over them. The Gentiles love to flaunt their authority and snap their finger and see how many people they can make come to serve them. But that's not the way it's to be among you. So if I'm going to have the right attitude, I've got to lower myself. I've got to humble myself and I've got to come to see the needs of others as more important than my own. I've got to come to see my brethren not as opportunities to be served by them but to see my brethren as opportunities to render service unto them and unto the Lord. So it takes an attitude. But secondly, if we're going to serve, we have to serve with awareness. A Christian's life is not a life that is put on, on cruise control where we just react to whatever comes along the way. No, there are numerous admonitions telling us that we are to be alert and that we are to be diligent in our service to Christ in our service to one another. What do we need to be aware of? 
Well, there are three things I want us to consider here, three things we need to be aware of. First, we need to be aware of our unique talents. I said we, we need to look at others, and that's true, but, but for this moment right here, let's look at ourselves. What are your talents? What are your abilities? Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul addresses this. He, he's talking about the church as a collective body, but all the members bring some unique things together to this one body. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There's a list of some gifts that God had given the members there. And it's not an exhaustive list. It's just a handful of things. But it's, it's something to get us started with looking at ourselves. What has God given me? What gift did He give you when He formed you in your mother's womb and gave you life? We all have unique gifts. We need to learn what those are and we need to work on those and make them better and stronger so we're more profitable servants to the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with learning new talents and learning new abilities. But each of us bring our own unique talents when we come together. What is your talent? What is your ability? Is it teaching? Are you an exceptional teacher? Is that a talent you have? Then use it. Maybe it's leading singing. Maybe it's serving in a public way. Uh, maybe it's exhorting or encouraging. Maybe you are a Barnabas. We need people like that today, don't we? We need you. Use that gift. Maybe you are a giver. Maybe you're the kind of person that you can give something to someone who is in need and you, you can do it in a way that they don't feel bad about receiving it from you. That's a talent. Use it. Use that talent. What, whatever your talent is, be aware of it and put it on the altar and say, Lord, here it is for you. Use it. So you need to be aware of your talents. Secondly, you need to be aware of your task. Good servants don't have to be told, hey, you got to get up and serve. No, servants know that they have to serve. We know what our task is. In the book of Titus, and really the book of Titus in its entirety addresses this urgency. Hey, get up and work. Get, get busy and do something. The, the, the people on the island of Crete were notorious for being lazy gluttons. So overcome that by being ready to work. Chapter 3 verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. If you want to be a good servant, then get on duty and stay on duty. Be aware of your task. And third, with this point, you need to be aware of the needs of others. Jesus saw and responded to the needs of others. And in, in doing this, as you go back and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see how Jesus interacted with people, and see how He re reacted to the situations that were brought before Him. And the people who cried out to Him, Have mercy on us, Son of David. And the messengers who were sent to him, someone is lying sick unto death, come and help. And how many times he responded. He would react to that. He saw the needs of others. We need to do the same thing. A good servant doesn't think of himself first. A good servant doesn't think of herself first. Good servants think of others. Good servants are selfless people. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Hey, that's mine. That's mine. I want what is mine. It's not what the Scriptures teach. You don't, you don't approach your brethren with that mentality. 
Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. It's about others. That's the secret to happiness. That's the secret to living a life that is worth living. Having it focused on others and not on self. So we have attitude, and we have awareness. That's what we need if we're going to be good servants. But there's a third thing, and that is action. Think about it. The word serve is a verb. Verb means action. You, you can't call yourself a servant and not serve. It's serving that makes you a servant. Uh, James chapter 2 talks about the, the, the foolishness of one who, who makes a good uh, profession to someone or, or says, be warm and be filled, but, but they don't do to meet the need. James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, I hope that you're, you're warm and you're filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? You haven't helped them. You're not a servant. In the book of 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, but whoever has this world's goods, that'd be you and me. Brian just mentioned and just prayed for us regarding our collection. We are blessed people. We all have more than we need. So when you are reading these scriptures and you read about the one who is blessed and the one who has, that's you if you're wondering. That's you. That's me. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Serving is what makes us a servant. So how is it that we are going to serve our brethren? Three things under this point. First, obviously, there are going to be times when physical needs have to be met. That was true in the New Testament when members of the church came to be in need. It's true in our time as well. In Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus is giving us this scene of the judgment day, He says that He is going to appear and set upon His throne, and all of mankind is going to be brought before Him and divided into two groups. Well, to those who are saved, He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Where's your service? What is it that, that you and I have been doing if there is a physical need, Jesus says that when we feed those who are hungry, when we house those of our brethren who are without, and give them the clothing that they need, and visit them when they need to be visited and taken care of, that we are doing these things unto Him. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress. James 1, verse 27. So the most obvious way that we can serve others, that the action that is involved is meeting their physical needs. But in our day and time today, in our culture today, that is not the most urgent need. Consider the emotional needs that our brethren have. That's where we're truly called upon to step in and to serve and to help. Romans chapter 12 verse 15 says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's uncomfortable sometimes, but we are to do it. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says that we are to bear one another's 
burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14 says that we are to comfort the faint-hearted, that we are to uphold the weak. Hebrews 12, 12 mentions the hands that hang down. The people who have been through so much, they don't think they can make it through. They don't see how they can make it through another day. That's where we step in and serve. I've got to tell you, the church here at Knollwood does this very well. I'm glad my family and I are here. We've been recipients of this time and again. And we're learning from you how to serve in this way. But it, it requires action. When someone is hurting, we need to step up. And we need to serve. And then finally under this point, there are times when we need to meet the spiritual needs of our brethren. Because not, always, not everyone who's on the church roll, not everyone who's in the membership directory, not everyone who's showing up and sitting on the pew is in the right relationship with God they need to be in. Babes in Christ need to be fed and established in the faith. Those who are struggling need to be exhorted. Hey, you can do it. Keep on keeping on. Those who are overwhelmed need to be restored. The unruly need to be warned. And the unfaithful need to be rescued and turned back into the fold. Are we doing that? That's how we serve our brethren. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. And we need to be ready to do these things to everyone to help those in the world who are poor and who are without, as we have opportunity, let's do that, uh, to help those who are outside of Christ, who are facing emotional crises in their life. A lot of times, that's the open door to lead them to Christ. Let's be ready to serve them. And those who are, are struggling spiritually with the burden of sin outside of Christ, yes, let's go and let's help them. Let's be ready. But notice, especially those who are of the household of faith, that's where we need to begin. So let's be servants of one another. Not in word, not in name, but in deed and in truth. And then finally, it requires availability. If we're going to be a servant, we have to be there to serve, don't we? Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. I want us to read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10 and I know many of us have read and studied this before. Let's read through it as if we're listening to Jesus for the first time deliver this parable. And let's, let's allow him to paint this picture of these three individuals who encounter this man. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I want you to notice some things that were required to help this man who is in this unfortunate position. First was time. Serving is going to require our time. We can't make out a check and send it in and cover our serving. Now, serving requires time. Unfortunately, in our modern world, it seems as if time is the one thing that we are least able to give to other people. But you and I both know that we make time for the things that we want to do. If it's important enough, we're going to make the time to do it, aren't we? The greatest in the kingdom is a servant. That's the greatest thing we can do with our time. So let's make the time to serve 
others. If we want to follow the example of Christ, if we want to help our brethren, we'll make the time to do it. Secondly, we have to get personally involved. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves and we're going to have to get our hands dirty dealing with problems when we serve other people. Jesus didn't seclude himself in some university somewhere where he devoted himself to just full-time study and writing. Jesus didn't go live in a monastery somewhere. Jesus was out among the people. He walked with them in the streets. He was with them in the marketplace, in the synagogue, in their homes. He was available to them. When they called out, have mercy on us, and the disciples said, you all be quiet. It was Jesus who said, bring them to me. When the parents brought the little children to Jesus to bless them, the disciples said, don't waste the Lord's time. And it was the Lord who said, forbid them not. It was Jesus who made himself available to others. Are you making yourself available to your brethren to be of help to them? Or when you hear of the situation, and that sounds like a very terrible situation, and that is a mess, and that's going to take someone getting involved, and I don't really want to do that. You're not being a servant. That's not a servant's heart. You need to make yourself available to them. The priest, he didn't make himself available. The Levite, he crossed the street and at least stopped and looked down, but he had some place to be. It was... It was the Samaritan who was on a business trip. He gave his time and he got involved and he helped. And there's a third thing here. It requires a sacrifice on our part. Serving others is always going to require a sacrifice. The priest and the Levite didn't sacrifice anything. The priest didn't even cross the street. But the Samaritan, he made himself available. He sacrificed his safety. Do you imagine happening upon this, traveling on that road that scholars tell us was notorious for bandits? He could have happened upon this site and he could have looked at it like the priest did and said, you know what, that's just a setup. His buddies are waiting in the bushes there and as soon as I stop and, and lower myself down and let, let down my guard, they're going to attack me and robbed me. He sacrificed his safety. He sacrificed his time, his property. He took out his oil, his wine, his bandages and put on this man. He sacrificed the comfort of his own animal and put this wounded man up on the animal to ride. When he got to the end, he sacrificed his money. He took money out of his wallet and laid it on the counter for that man. He made a sacrifice. There's going to be times when you and I are going to have to make a sacrifice in order to serve. We're going to have to sacrifice our time. We're going to have to sacrifice our how nice it is, the convenience of not having to get involved in a hairy situation. We're going to have to sacrifice that and get involved and make the time to make ourselves available to them. What does it take to serve? It takes availability. Here's our last slide. Learning how to be the kind of servant that the Lord would have us to be requires the right attitude. It requires awareness, both of ourselves and of what's going on around us. It requires action. You're not a servant if you're not serving. And it requires availability. Why be a servant? I want you to think about this. Jesus Christ is the greatest man that the world has ever known. He was not a political leader or a military commander. He was not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He was not a champion athlete, a trend-setting celebrity, an adored performer, a successful lawyer, or a life-saving doctor. He was not one of the many things to which this shallow world attributes greatness. He was a servant. But yet, in his willingness to serve mankind, he was given the name that is above every name. Just as the Son of Man 
did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. If you are here this morning, and you are a Christian, I can say with confidence that what the Lord wants you to be is a servant. A servant like Him. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, I can say with confidence that what the Lord wants you to be is a Christian. Would you believe that He is the Son of God? Would you repent of your sins and turn away from them, knowing what He gave up for you? Would you confess His name? Would you be baptized to have your sins washed away? It's as easy as that. If that is your desire, then we would stand ready to help you and to assist you in that. Whatever your spiritual need is, would you please let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song.